mother of the Bodhisattva in his final birth. I remember studying a little bit about what the commentaries say about the past life of Wisaka, that she'd actually trained under previous Buddhas, being more and more and more generous with each Buddha until she had enough of the Dana Bharami and enough of the auspicious merit to be the foremost woman patroness of the of a teaching Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha. And I suspect that it's similar. I was thinking about Maya Devi, the Bodhisattva's mother in his final life, and I think that it's probably the case that she's given birth to the Bodhisattva many thousands of lives so that she would have that karmic connection and that honor and that privilege. And I was thinking in a way, what a gift that was also. The beings who were supporting the Bodhisattva in his mission and his journey, incredibly long, imponderably long journey. So when we think of Maya Devi, a lot of gratitude. Most of the women here who've had children know that giving birth isn't that much fun. And raising children, there's a lot of joy, there's a lot of sorrow, a lot of headaches, a lot of worry. I don't think mothers ever stop worrying about their children unless there are hunts. So think of that, think of thousands of lives as the mother of the Bodhisattva. That's quite an offering, isn't it? Ensuring that the being that will keep building those qualities and accumulating that merit has what he needs, human body. So I'm going to read a little bit from the life of the Buddha. And uh, one of the things Lord Buddha says, or Ananda is actually relaying what he'd heard the Buddha say, that mindful and fully aware, the Bodhisattva lived in Tushita heaven, which is the fourth heaven up, heaven of the contented, before coming down and having the final life on earth. And then mindful and fully aware, he descended into the womb, so that's already unusual. Most beings don't live out an entire life mindful and fully aware in heaven. They're mindful sometimes, fully aware sometimes, but probably have fuzzy mindfulness and some confusion and various hindrances affecting the mind a lot of the time. But the Bodhisattva was mindful and fully aware in the life in Tushita, and then mindful and fully aware descended into the mother's womb. And the mother had dreamt of the white elephant, if you recall. So I'll read from the life of the Buddha. I'll just mention this first. Ananda is talking with some of the other monks at Jetavana. And the Buddha, what he was actually talking about, it's wonderful, it's marvelous. The way Buddhas can remember the past lives of previous Buddhas. And they can remember previous Buddhas and they can remember what their names were, what their chief disciples were. And he was saying how wonderful and how marvelous that was. Thus I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sabati in Jeta's Grove, and Atapindika's Park. Then a number of bhikkhus were waiting in an assembly hall where they had met together on return for their arms round after their meal was over. Meanwhile it was being said among them, It is wonderful, friends, it is marvellous how the perfect one's power and might enable him to know of past Buddhas who attained the complete extinction of defilement, cut the tangle, broke the circle, ended the round, and surmounted all suffering. Such were those blessed ones' births, such their names, such their clans, such their virtue, such their concentration, such their understanding, such their abiding, such the manner of their deliverance. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda told the bhikkhus, Perfect ones are wonderful friends and have wonderful qualities. Perfect ones are marvelous and have marvelous qualities. However, their talk, meanwhile, was left unfinished, for now it was already evening, and the Blessed One, who had risen from retreat, came to the assembly hall and sat down on the seat made ready. Then he asked the bhikkhus, Bhikkhus, for what talk are you gathered together here now? And what was your talk, meanwhile, that was left unfinished? What the bhikkhus and the Venerable Ananda had said was related, and they added, Lord, this was our talk, meanwhile, that was left unfinished, for the Blessed One arrived. Then the Blessed One turned to the Venerable Ananda. That being so, Ananda, explain the Perfect One's wonderful and marvelous qualities more fully. I heard and learned this, Lord, from the Blessed One's own lips. Mindful and fully aware, the Bodhisattva, the being dedicated to enlightenment, appeared in the heaven of the contented, 
and I remember that as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the Blessed One. I heard and learned this, Lord, from the Blessed One's own lips. Mindful and fully aware, the Bodhisattva remained in the heaven of the contented. For the whole of that lifespan, the Bodhisattva remained in the heaven of the contented. Mindful and fully aware, the Bodhisattva passed away from the heaven of the contented and descended into his mother's womb. When the Bodhisattva had passed away from the heaven of the contented and entered his mother's womb, a great measureless light surpassing the splendor of the gods appeared in the world with its deities, its maras, its brahma divinities, in this generation with its monks and brahmins, with its princes and men. And even in those abysmal world interspaces of vacancy, gloom and utter darkness, meaning the hell realms or praetor realms, where the moon, the sun, powerful and mighty as they are, cannot make their light prevail, there too a great measureless light surpassing the splendor of the gods appeared, and the creatures born there perceived each other by that light. So it seems that other creatures have appeared here, and this ten thousand fold world system shook and quaked and trembled, and there too a great measureless light surpassing the splendor of the gods appeared. So if you think now in terms of four imponderably long periods that only Buddhas can measure, that they call an incalculable period, plus 100,000 eons, if you think of those millions of lives, imagine the merit accumulated. And try to imagine it now as a pile of light, gold light or white light, all of the wholesome deeds. Can you imagine? We all have faith as Buddhists in making good karma and accumulating merit. What kind of merit has been accumulated in millions of lives of perfecting virtue, perfecting samadhi, perfecting wisdom? You remember when the Bodhisattva left the palace and he went to find his first teachers? His first teachers taught him the seventh jhana and the eighth jhana, the highest types of concentration possible for a human being to achieve, and he mastered them quickly. You think about the amount of practice and preparation a Bodhisattva has put into his task. And then imagine that merit, which is a condition, the Bodhisattva is working with the conditions, the utterly wholesome extreme of conditions, then imagine all of that positive potential, accumulated merit, and vastly skillful qualities coming down from the fourth heaven and landing in somebody's womb on this planet. I suspect that this isn't metaphorical when it says that a vast measureless light shone through the whole world and the heavens and the hells as well. Because that's what it is, isn't it? Light, bright, profoundly wholesome qualities accumulated in unimaginably vast amounts. So it's said that a light shone even to the darkest parts of the, the hells and the Prater realms down below and the earth shook. It's a kind of an earthquake, but it's not an earthquake that causes damage. It means the four elements literally quiver with the goodness on the level of consciousness in the mind, the citta of the Bodhisattva as he descends into the womb. When the Bodhisattva had descended into his mother's womb, four deities came to guard him from the four quarters. So that's the four kings, as we chant in the Dhammachaka Sutta, Chattu Maharajika Deva, so that no human or non-human beings or anyone at all should harm his or her mother. So understanding that the devas have a quality of divine eye, they can see more subtle phenomena than most human beings can. Human beings who meditate can see these as well. But they would see the vastness of the radiance of the aura of that being. So they would know very well. This is no ordinary being. Tanajan Anand once explained to me that the way devas know who has more merit is the extent of their rasami, their halo. So the more merit you have, the bigger the halo is, that ball of light that shines from your mind. So they instantly know who's been accumulating more barami, who has more merit, and they instantly respect each other according to the amount of merit. Tanachan explained that. So you imagine what devas could see when that bodhisattva came into the womb. So it's said that the four kings came to guard him so that no human or non-human beings or anyone at all should harm him or his mother. When the Bodhisattva had descended into his mother's womb, she became intrinsically pure, 
refraining by necessity from killing living beings, from taking what is not given, from unchastity, from false speech, and from indulgence in wine, liquor, and fermented brews. So it's keeping the five precepts, as the Bodhisattva has done for millions of lives. When the Bodhisattva had descended into his mother's womb, no thought of man associated with the five strands of sensual desires came to her at all, as she was inaccessible to any man with lustful mind. Understand also that the Bodhisattva must have practiced as a brahmachari, somebody gone forth from the home life many, many, many thousands of times. So he has that renunciation barami. We were chanting just before, ne karma barami. That's something in his mind established. So it would be an interesting experience for the mother, wouldn't it? All of a sudden, someone else's mind is in the space of her mind with all these incredibly vast, amazing qualities in that mind latent, obviously having quite an effect on the mum's mind. When the Bodhisattva had descended into his mother's womb, she at the same time possessed the five strands of sensual desires, so she had all pleasant sounds, pleasant feelings, pleasant tastes. Being endowed and furnished with them, she was gratified. When the Bodhisattva had descended into his mother's womb, no kind of affliction arose in her. She was blissful in the absence of all bodily fatigue. So I would assume that that's a result of merit, isn't it? And the Buddha said that merit is synonymous with happiness, Whatever good things you do, whatever happy, pleasant feelings that you cause other beings to have with your generosity or with your metta, with your sila, then you also experience that as a result. So the merit of the bodhisattva, then the mum is experiencing no affliction, and she was blissful the whole time. How many people have a nine-month pregnancy experiencing unceasful bliss? Pretty rare. This is a special pregnancy. And this is interesting too. As though a blue, yellow, red, white, or brown thread was strung through a fine beryl gem of purest water, eight-faceted and well-cut, so that a man with sound eyes taking it in his hand might review it thus. This is a fine beryl gem of purest water, eight-faceted and well-cut, and through it is strung a blue, yellow, red, white, or brown thread. So too the Bodhisattva's mother saw him within her womb, with all his limbs and lacking no faculty. So the mum also had some of the divine eye for the period that the Bodhisattva was in her womb. Seven days after the Bodhisattva was born, his mother died and was reborn in the heaven of the contented. Other women give birth after carrying the child in the womb for nine or ten months, but not so the Bodhisattva's mother. She gave birth to him after carrying him in her womb for exactly ten months. Other women give birth seated or lying down, but not so the Bodhisattva's mother. She gave birth to him standing up. When the Bodhisattva came forth from his mother's womb, first deities received him, then human beings. So the devas have caught him in their hands, lowering him gently to the earth. When the Bodhisattva came forth from his mother's womb, he did not touch the earth. The four deities received him and set him before his mother, saying, Rejoice, O queen, a son of great power has been born to you. When the Bodhisattva came forth from his mother's womb, just as if a gem were placed on Banaras cloth, the gem would not smear the cloth, or the cloth the gem, why not? Because both are pure. So too, the Bodhisattva came forth from his mother's womb unsullied, unsmeared by water or humors or blood or any sort of impurity, clean and unsullied. When the Bodhisattva came forth from his mother's womb, two jets of water appeared to pour from the sky, one cool and one warm for bathing the Bodhisattva and his mother. As soon as the Bodhisattva was born, he stood firmly with his feet on the ground. Then he took seven steps to the north, and with the white sunshade held over him, he surveyed each quarter. He uttered the words of the leader of the herd, I am the highest in the world. I am the best in the world. I am the foremost in the world. This is the last birth. Now there is no more renewal of being in future lives. So this is a statement that can be misunderstood. I once met a Chinese lady in Sydney who told me that she didn't have faith in the Buddha because she thought he was narcissistic and egotistical. I'm like, what? She said, yeah, all of this, I'm the foremost in the world, I'm the best in the world. She was unimpressed by that. We need to understand that this is coming from Buddha's clear understanding of the truth. It's not an egotistical statement. From what he could see with his vast awareness, he was. 
was the person with the most barmy on the planet at that time. And he'd uh, intended to be in that position to fulfill his very particular task. When the Bodhisattva came forth from his mother's womb, a great measureless light surpassing the splendor of the gods appeared in the world with its deities, its maras, and its Brahma divinities. In this generation with its monks and Brahmins, its princes and men, and even in those abysmal world interspaces of vacancy, gloom, and utter darkness, where the moon and sun, powerful and mighty as they are, cannot make their light prevail, there too a great measureless light surpassing the splendor of the gods appeared, and the creatures born there perceived each other by that light, etc. And this ten thousand fold world system shook and quaked and trembled, and there too a great measureless light surpassing the splendor of the gods appeared. Ananda continues, All these things I heard and learned from the Blessed One's own lips, and I remember them as wonderful and marvelous qualities of the Blessed One. Lord Buddha, having many wonderful qualities perfected, then finishes the conversation with something profoundly wise. That being so, Ananda, remember also this as a wonderful and marvelous quality of a perfect one. A perfect one's feelings of pleasure, pain, or equanimity are known to him as they arise, known to him as they are present, and known to him as they subside. His perceptions are known to him as they arise, known to him as they are present, and known to him as they subside. His thoughts are known to him as they arise, known to him as they are present, and known to him as they subside. Ananda, and that also I remember, Lord, as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the Blessed One. That is what the Venerable Ananda said, the Master approved, the bhikkhus were satisfied, and they delighted in the Venerable Ananda's words. So Lord Buddha, Tathagata, another word for Buddha, meaning thus come and also thus gone. You have like a purified appearance in the Buddha. All qualities perfected and no identification with any of them. And he's perfectly capable of fulfilling his functions for benefiting beings, but he doesn't think he's a self for a second. So the Lord Buddha is training us and explaining to us to see the five khandhas, the forms, the thoughts, the feelings, the perceptions, consciousness as not self, or see them as they are, they're not a self and just to see them as separate phenomena arising together due to conditions and then seeing the arising, the ceasing, the arising, the ceasing. Similarly with the four foundations of mindfulness, to be aware of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral feelings as they arise and pass away, arise and pass away. And when we do that, if we can do that consistently, we will have insights into not-self. The delusion of perceiving things as a self will fall away. And the cause of delusion is ignorance as to truth. The antidote to that is the mindfulness and wisdom which sees things as they are. Then there is an ignorance. When there is an ignorance, the delusion falls away. We can't perceive things as a self. We understand how the self has been a habitual way of perceiving things, but we understand it conventionally. But we understand it as not correct, a delusion. And it's also said about Buddhists that they teach according to conventional speech, so they still have conversations and understand conventions, relate to people skillfully so that they can understand it, but they know that they're not a self and they know that others aren't a self. So in a way, Ananda is celebrating the Buddha as a wonderful being, which he is. Buddha is also pointing out the fact that he's also not a being at the same time. Thus come and thus gone. With regards to the accumulated beautiful qualities of the Bodhisattva. Many of you know the story of the sage that came to see the young prince in the palace. And when he saw the young prince, when he looked at the physiognomy, the physical attributes of the little baby, he could see that it was a really remarkable being. And he could see that he was going to be one of two things a wheel-turning monarch, meaning a ruler of the entire planet, or a great sage. And then he started to weep. He actually realized that he wouldn't be alive because he was old already. He wouldn't be alive to see this great being blossom. So not just Davis could see this is no ordinary being. Also human beings who had skills 
could see even from the physical body that the, uh, all of those wonderful qualities and profound merits coming together for this final birth, for this final task. It's pretty amazing when you think that at the same time that the Bodhisattva was coming down, a lot of those beings that became his great disciples were also coming down around the same time. So you imagine Ananda, Anuruddha, the chariot driver, the deva that lives in the Bodhi tree also came down at the same time. You imagine there must have just been this descent from heaven like snow of, of incredibly radiant, luminous beings falling on the planet that were going to be the hundreds of thousands of arahants must have been pretty amazing. If one had divine eye, it must have been an amazing thing to see. So, apparently in about 300 million years from one prophecy I read, there'll be another Buddha. <laughs> they don't appear very often. And apparently before this eon, there was these two Buddhas, Siki and Wesabu. There were five eons, no, seven. Seven eons before this, there were Siki and Wesabu Buddhas. And then there were seven eons with no Buddhas. And then we have this eon where we have five, we're told. Lord Buddha does speak in the suttas about the coming of Maitreya Buddha, or Maitreya in Pali. So, it's a rare, special and wonderful thing to meet with the teachings of these wonderful beings. And it's a wonderful thing to come on pilgrimage because, as Lord Buddha said himself, in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. When you come and you pay respects at these places, it's similar to paying respects to him yourself. Ananda asked him, who will we pay respects to when uh, you're not here anymore? And he said, future generations should come and pay respects at the place of the birth, the place of the enlightenment, the place of the turning of the wheel, and the place of the Mahaparinibbana. And uh, Tanajana Nan explained that to me that Lord Buddha had very special qualities psychic powers and special skills related to samadhi. So anyone with samadhi, really real samadhi, develops some special skills. But when it's an enlightened being, the samadhi is even purer and even more powerful and the special skills are more refined. Then with a Buddha, much more so. They're just so adept at uh, understanding consciousness and these four elements and they're masters. Remember the Bodhisattva mastering the seventh and the eighth jhanas very quickly. So once he was a Buddha, his jhanas would have been even more amazing. So using his psychic powers, he blessed these places. And Tanajanan said, literally putting a large amount of his accumulated merit and barami, that's a condition. Those are conditions within the conditioned world. So he's placed them in these places. And so that those who come, he does say that, those who come with a mind of faith and confidence, paying respects with that, those qualities, those beings that will be for their benefit for a long, long time. So we get a similar quality of merit as paying respects to Lord Buddha himself, a similar quality of merit of listening to that first sermon. So then we have to take that merit, of course, and recollect it, recollect the fact that we come on pilgrimage, recollect that we do retreats, recollect that we visit enlightened masters if we can, and all of these things, recollect the merit and then apply it in our consistent mindfulness, apply it in meditating frequently and uh, listening to teachings frequently and not getting lost in restlessness and not getting lost in distraction and not getting lost in laziness, all of these ways that the hindrances can distract us. It's another thing we do, isn't it, when we're on pilgrimage, we set that determination to practice a bit more, a bit harder recognizing that the Bodhisattva's efforts were heroic and extraordinary and motivated by compassion, we're very, very fortunate that he was so loving and kind. And all of those beings that supported him. So then it gives rise to a feeling of katanyu. But we've benefited from this incredible amount of selflessness. So recognizing that we've been given something. We didn't have a right to this. It's uh, something we were given. The Bodhisattva didn't have to do what he did. Bodhisattva could have been an arahant under Dipankara Buddha millions of lives ago. But he was concerned and he built all of those qualities so that he could come and help us. We recollect that and actually feel blessed. It's, that's not a guilt trip. You shouldn't feel guilty about that. You realize, my goodness, how fortunate we are that this very, very special being invested this much, motivated by love, because he wanted to help people like me. And then you feel blessed and you feel grateful. And then also there's a feeling of not wanting to take that for granted. 
then I want to use this special blessing, I want to use this special opportunity, I also want to repay my gratitude for the incredible sacrifice that that being made for people like me. So, just offering a few words of encouragement, hope something is useful. I also rejoice in everyone's good efforts on this pilgrimage. I think everyone's doing very well. A lot of early mornings and uh, expressing our willingness to put forth effort and be a bit determined and practice some patience, getting up early in the morning, walking in the cold air, right back there in Bogh Gaya, many early mornings, and up Volta's Peak, more early mornings here in Lumbini, early mornings, and coming and spending long sessions, sitting longer than you normally would. And I think this is proof in a way, isn't it, that is a special quality of blessing in these places, because sometimes we're tired and we sit and the mind becomes peaceful. Sometimes we're sick and we sit and the mind becomes peaceful. Sometimes there's a lot of noise and we sit and we don't become irritated, we don't become grumpy. So we can see that if we were in other places, we might not have that level of resolve or that level of peacefulness might not. And sometimes in very unlikely situations where you just think, oh, what's the point? But you sit and you try and then all of a sudden the mind finds this very vast and spacious quality of stillness or peace. So I think most people have had some experience of that at several of the sites already. And uh, it's part of our reason why we can keep applying the effort with the level of inspiration. So let's keep it up. It's just a few more days now. And uh, I do appreciate everyone's sincere efforts. And uh, I think most of us are feeling a bit healthier now as well. Many people got quite sick early on. I think that was part of this group's karma. Usually most people become getting sick at the 5th, 6th, 7th day or 10th day. And now I can see most people are healthy. We all got sick in the first week. <laughs> so that was a particular challenge that we had. Usually it's good if you get this wave of inspiration and you get a few nice meditations and then you get sick. It's, uh, it's kind of easier in terms of a process because you're already inspired. But what was good to see, though, was even though many people got sick, we didn't let up. We kept applying the effort and we kept practicing. And now we're uh, feeling quite a bit healthier. While we're here, just realizing that since this is one of the four, we've done it in the last two as well, I think. Should we make a formal asking of forgiveness and a formal dedication of merits while we're here? And I uh, made a lot of good karma, so we can share that. Please repeat after me. Homage to the blessed, Homage to the blessed. noble, Noble. And perfectly enlightened one. Perfectly enlightened. Homage to the blessed, to noble, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Perfectly enlightened. Homage to the blessed, to the noble, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Perfectly. We take this opportunity now with a mind of faith, mind of faith. and respect, and respect to pay our respects. To the, site to the site where the Bodhisattva, where the Bodhisattva was born into, this world born into this world in his last life. His last life. We, recognize we recognize that the Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva had, spent had spent millions of lives cultivating prerequisite qualities, prerequisite qualities motivated by, motivated by great, compassion, great compassion, great love, great, love, great self-sacrifice, self so that he could benefit, so he could benefit as, many as many beings as possible. Recognizing this incredible self-sacrifice, self extraordinary love and compassion, we give rise to feelings of deep appreciation, recognition, and gratitude to the profound effort of the Mahabodhisattva, who became the Samma Samputta. And we thank with all of our hearts Lord Buddha for his profound wise realization and his profoundly wise, liberating teachings. We also take the opportunity now to ask forgiveness if there is anything that might have been done 
which was unskillful by body, speech or mind towards the Bodhisattva or towards the Buddha in this or past lives we acknowledge fault and we ask forgiveness and we make the determination to take more care and be more careful any other bodhisattvas currently cultivating the prerequisite qualities accumulating the enormous merits if we have offended any of these beings knowingly or unknowingly intentionally or unintentionally we also acknowledge fault and ask forgiveness any great disciples of future Buddhas currently accumulating virtue and vast merit if we have done anything unskillful by body, speech or mind in this life or previous lives intentionally or unintentionally knowingly or unknowingly we acknowledge the fault we ask forgiveness and set the intention to be more careful may we never be separated from the care of the Mahabodhi Sattas destined for Buddhahood or from the Buddhas or from their teachings or from their well-practicing disciples dedicate the merit of this aspiration to all beings karmically connected to us via wholesome or unwholesome deeds may we all only ever think of benefiting each other may we all realize Nibbana and be liberated from every kind of suffering Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.
，是无争分，周人出一切不争，是不虚，不说破了破罗蜜多舍彼所都也。Oh, my God.